the magnificent Midwest, it's the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week as we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives about men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. Don't marry the first person you fall in love with. The more relationship experience you have before getting married, the better. That way you'll really know yourself when you say, I do. For decades, this has been the relationship narrative passed on to the young and unattached. But my experience as a relationship coach suggests the opposite is true. And so does the data. Theoretically, this argument makes sense. If we need to try on a lot of genes to get just the right fit, shouldn't we do the same when it comes to the most important decision of our lives? But in fact, having more relationship experience is correlated to having a less happy marriage or a less or having less relationship stability later on. As countercultural as that sounds, when you understand the reasons why, it makes perfect sense. As Galena Rhodes of the National Marriage Project explains, in a short video, which I have linked for you in the show notes. She outlines three main reasons for this surprising outcome. Number one, having more relationship experience leads to knowing what the alternatives might be, which in turn can make it difficult to invest in your marriage. What's more, our memory of those alternatives aren't reliable since we tend to remember the good things and forget about the bad. In fact, not being aware of the alternatives could very well be a marital advantage, which sort of makes sense because you have nothing in your mind about the relationship that you are in to sort of muck up or cloud your your thinking. So that's number one. Having more relationship experience leads to knowing what the alternatives might be. Number two, having a lot of relationship experience invariably leads to comparisons. I don't think anybody could argue this point. It's kind of obvious. And so when conflict arises in your marriage, it can be tempting to think, you know, I didn't have this problem with so-and-so without remembering that there were plenty of other problems that you had with that person that you don't have in your marriage or in your current relationship. It's absolutely futile to make comparisons because every relationship has its own unique set of problems and switching partners usually just means we're going to switch problems. And yet people, women mainly, to be honest, tend to compare their current partner to their past partner or partners in their head a lot, just as a general rule, which can cause them to believe they're with the wrong person when that's not necessarily the case. So those chronic comparisons, and again, when you have a long list of um, people you know, with whom to compare, you can see how that would make things very difficult for you. It would take a lot of discipline to just not think about that. And the third one is that having more relationship experience means actually having more experience ending relationships, which can make, which can make divorce a more viable option in your brain. So the experience of having moved into relationships only to move out of them and doing that multiple times is actually the muscle you've exercised. Not, not having some wonderful, um, um, helpful experiences that are going to lend itself well to your future marriage. It just doesn't work out that way. It can also make it easy to focus on the negatives in your marriage rather than on the positives. So those are the three things. Um, and None of that, of course, is to suggest that your marriage or relationship is doomed if you do have a rich relationship history. Studies like these are designed to help us understand averages or the likelihood of an outcome. They're not written in stone. But what the data does remarkably well is to help put your relationship in perspective so that when conflict occurs, you don't get sucked into the grass is greener mentality in which you are romanticizing the past or making comparisons to either your past relationships or to other people's relationships. Chronic comparisons have become rife in our culture, mainly because of social media, which makes it appear as though there's always some better option out there for you. But that is rarely the case. 
more often than not, that other option has just as many problems of its own. You just can't see that through the screen, through the phone screen. It looks so pretty. Something I've noticed over the years is that this narrative about more relationship experience being better is often passed on by parents. I usually focus on culture, as you know, but in this case, I think it's something that's primarily passed on in the home by very well-meaning but misguided parents. I mean, let's face it, it's, it's common for parents who have regrets about their own lives to advise their kids to do things opposite of the way they did it. We all do this, and it can certainly be helpful, but very often parents' past choices, particularly their relationship choices, aren't really relevant to the situation at hand because our past choices were linked to the times in which we lived. And this is true for every generation. So for example, during World War II, many couples got engaged or married because they didn't know if or when they would see each other again, right? And that circumstance no longer applies. So we wouldn't use it as a benchmark for marriages today. Similarly, technology, social media, and hookup culture have changed the landscape so dramatically that those of us who are over 50, let's say, can't relate. We, we just didn't have all of that. We didn't deal with all of that. So many parents, though, in my generation tell their children to date around a lot and to worry about marriage later, often due to their own life regrets or because they're simply repeating what they've been groomed to believe is really good advice. The problem is this advice doesn't work in the culture we live in today. In my mother's day, for example, she was born in 1930. Women could afford to casually date around or even date several men at once because why? Why would that be? They weren't having sex with these men. Dating in those days was focused on dating for marriage, not dating for fun or with no commitment in sight the way so many couples do today. There was no rampant shacking up going on and there was certainly no hookup culture. So when you're dating somebody and not having sex with them, it's much more easy to, uh, to, to quote unquote date around or to keep things light. So the advice to worry about marriage later and stay focused on career today is bad advice because with traditional dating dead and casual sex normalized, prioritizing career will almost, almost always, or certainly lead to a string of broken relationships that are almost always sexual in nature. And if the data is correct, this will make marriage more challenging, not less. So if your young adult son or daughter is in a healthy relationship, one that has no red flags that you can see, don't encourage him or her to put marriage off specifically in order to stay focused on themselves or on their career, because that's just what you do today, because that's the status quo. Those who prioritize career and follow that status quo, often wind up in long distance relationships or inadvertently competing with each other's careers. Both of these things make the relationship fragile. Conversely, couples who prioritize the relationship instead stand a better chance of long-term success because the priority is to build the relationship. It makes no sense to encourage young people to date around to see what else is out there when there is zero proof that more relationship experience equates to a better marriage, which is pretty much what's been sold to young people for a very long time now, especially when dating around today means having sex with a lot of different people. Today's young adults are long overdue for a new relationship narrative that sounds something like this. Whom you marry and how that marriage fares will have more effect on your happiness and well being than anything else you do. It will be the axis upon which all other decisions are made where you live, how you live, and how happy or content you will be with your life. You can't just swap out a spouse the way you can a job or a career. It makes no sense then to put that decision at the bottom of the list or to push it off as long as humanly possible while you focus on your career, unless you have no desire to get married and have kids. If you do, 
choosing the right person to marry should be your number one priority. I should, shouldn't just say choosing, finding, right? Finding your number, finding the right person to marry. And here's another important part of this conversation. It isn't typically marriage, but having kids that creates the most upheaval in one's career, at least for women. In the past, getting married typically translated to having kids right away, but that doesn't have to be your story. You can still make marriage a priority without automatically including the children into the equation, if that makes sense. I mean, that's fine to do, obviously, but I'm saying that marriage and motherhood are not inextricably linked the way they used to be. You can postpone children somewhat despite being married. The point I'm making is that if you want to be a wife and mother, and you, I mean, you know that, then you make this life goal the priority by dating for marriage rather than for fun. That's probably the most countercultural thing I'm going to say in this video or in this podcast, because that's really the, the gist of it. Back in 2014, Matt Walsh of the Daily Wire wrote a great blog post about this very issue, and it was entitled, Here's Some Honest Dating Advice. I'll have that article linked as well in the show notes where he expounds upon the futility of dating for fun. Here's a portion of what he said, quote, dating is a complicated and serious thing. It can also be fun, but it isn't something you should do for pure recreation. Dating is supposed to be a means to an end. Or maybe a better way of putting it is dating is a means to a beginning. To put it simply, if you know for a fact that you would never marry a certain person, then you shouldn't be in a romantic relationship with them. Knowingly staying in a relationship without a future is like riding a dying horse into the desert. It's a slow, painful death march, and there's no chance of it working out in your favor. So go ahead and date, but date with a purpose. Date with a goal. Date with your eyes toward marriage. End quote. So how do you do that? I'm actually going to cover that next week in part two. In the meantime, another important reason why too much relationship experience is counterproductive is that most people develop deep emotional scars when their relationships end. I mean, how could you not? That's just sort of par for the course. I mean, if they were actual relationships as opposed to just hookups. People may deny them or try to push them away, but they almost always creep back up eventually. Some of these scars will be harder than others to shed, but they don't vanish just because you enter a new relationship. And if, and if you've had multiple serious relationships, you can multiply the baggage. One's ability to trust diminishes with each broken relationship. The only way to avoid this problem is to either exclusively date for marriage, or if you're going to date casually, leave the sex out of it. If you ever wondered why dating in our grandmother's day was so much easier, it's because of that very thing, as I mentioned before, because sex wasn't part of the equation. Marriage proposals were so common in my mother's day, who I think I, said, I, think I said earlier, I can't remember now, if she was, she was born in 1930, just FYI that women had to turn down other potential husbands before deciding on the right one. Completely inconceivable for women today, right? To even imagine. But as a young girl, I would find countless love letters that were stored in my mother's memory box, and many of them contained marriage proposals. I recall sifting through them and marveling at what it was like to have so many men pining for you. But again, the reason it was much easier for women in those days to find a husband is that dating was serious business. Marriage was the goal. So dating was therefore given the weight it deserves. And that fact, coupled with a lack of reliable birth control and a social expectation that sex was for marriage, I mean, let's face it, that was a big part of it, forced couples, as I said before, to keep things light. And the advantage of this approach is that it allows men and women to easily date around or to go out alone with the opposite sex and get to know the other person minus the sex. This is young single woman this is a young single woman's greatest trump card. 
casual dating is different for women than it is for men. Because of their biology, women have fewer chances to establish a serious relationship that can lead to marriage. So it's more costly for women to not be intentional about their love lives. You just lose too much time. And the fact is that men don't have the same biological clock that women do. And as a result, they can always date younger women as they get older. So the rules of engagement for dating have to be different for women than they are for men. Let's face it, the current dating scene sucks. It's terrible. People are hanging out without any structure or plans for the future, which, again, doesn't teach you any skills that are going to help you build a successful marriage. These so-called situationships, which if you haven't heard, well, I'm sure most of you have heard, but situationships means you're in some sort of something with someone, but you have no idea what it is that you're in. It's a These are a big, fat time waster. A string of failed relationships are not going to prepare you for marriage. If anything, it prepares you super well for how to end a relationship. To go back to Matt Walsh, quote, drowning doesn't make you a skilled swimmer. It just makes you afraid of the water, end quote. There's also this. Once a woman becomes a mother, she will quickly determine that her life before kids, before she had her kids, pales in comparison and feels utterly irrelevant. The mindset shift is that big for both sexes, actually. All of which is to say, don't listen to those who tell you to forget about love and family and to focus exclusively on career. And if that message came from your parents, cut them some slack. They no doubt meant well, but they just really didn't think it through. Because if the goal for women isn't supposed to be marriage and family anymore, the way it has always been in the past, what's the message about sex and relationships in the meantime? How are you supposed to navigate that? Just, just have casual sex or just be happy moving in and out of quasi-committed relationships as you stack up all this pain and heartache and wonder if you'll ever find lasting love? This is not an existence that's going to prepare you for marriage, which was the original argument. To circle back to that narrative, it was as follows. Don't marry the first person you fall in love with. The more relationship experience you have before getting married, the better. That way you'll know yourself better when you say, I do. It's painful when guidance you've received your entire life turns out to be flawed. But on the flip side, it's incredibly empowering to question the status quo of our dysfunctional dating culture and the relationship ideals with which you've been raised. In next week's podcast, I'm going to cover part two of this subject by listing eight rules that you can put into action immediately, eight dating rules, I should say, that you can put into action immediately if you're single and dating for marriage rather than for fun. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker Show. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and to leave us a review as well as share this episode with a friend. As always, you may reach me with any questions or comments at Suzanne at the SuzanneBankerShow.com. And if you would like to support this podcast, which would be very much appreciated, you can do so at Patreon.com forward slash the Suzanne Banker Show. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week.